joined by EEOC Commissioner Keith Sonderling and by his Chief Counsel, Brad Kelly, because just as you've been experiencing AI in the workplace, um, so have people all over the country and all over the world. And the focus of these talks are, you know, AI is this powerful tool and it has tremendous benefits and it also has a lot of risks. And how do we, um, you know, structure our legal frameworks? How do we create norms so we can capitalize on the benefits and mitigate the risks? And I am just thrilled and honored to have Commissioner Sonderling and um, Mr. Kelly join us here today um, to share their insights. So please uh, join me in giving them a big welcome. Thank you, Lee, for having us. I'm really excited to have this conversation and to be here today. And, you know, first of all, how many of you have taken employment discrimination or any kind of labor and employment law? So, so some of you. So uh, first, the EEOC, uh, we are uh, the agency that deals with, I like to say, the big tip ticket labor and employment issues. So a lot of things that you deal with if you're ever going to enter the workforce, which I imagine all of you would like to at some point, you're going to deal with the laws that the EEOC uh, administers and enforces. So when you think about the big ticket items like the Me Too movement, any sort of discrimination, age discrimination, religious discrimination, pregnancy discrimination, um, that's our agency as well, including other hot topics, uh, you know, like pay equity, the Me Too movement. Uh, we have a very big portfolio when it comes to the laws we enforce. We're not part of the Department of Labor. We're a separate independent agency um, like the SEC, like the National Labor Relations Board. We consist uh, of uh, commissioners from different parties um, that sit in Washington, D.C., like myself, that are required to be uh, confirmed by the United States Senate uh, for this position. So it's a little bit um, what I have to do in my day job, but why I'm here and uh, you know what we're going to talk about today is uh, uh, something that I took up uh, in 2021, um, because I, after looking at the landscape of uh, the labor employment uh, laws and the issues that were coming up, uh, you know, there's enough distractions with our daily work, as you heard, but, you know, what is the future of labor employment? What is the future of the workforce? And how are people going to uh, enter the workforce and be able to participate in the workforce, which in the United States, is some of the most fundamental civil rights that we have. You know, our agency was born out of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. So, you know, really the core of our agency deals with really fundamental civil rights. And what I noticed is that um, whether you're working for a large company, a small company, there's really one way now to get in the workforce, and that is through applying as basic as applying online or having some sort of technology review your resume, or make, uh, in some cases, make a decision about what your skills are, tell you things about yourself that you may not know, tell your employer or potential employer things about yourself um, and your skills and your ability. And you know, how are we getting there and how are these tools designed was the first question. And then the second, looking into it even deeper, was related to its use once you're actually an employee, once you get in. And now technology, and you know, we could talk more of what, what is AI and what isn't, is really being used for the entire employee life cycle. From, from the second you accept a job offer to determine what your pay is, to saying you know, at which uh, locations you should work at, some software saying how you're going to interact with your coworkers potentially um, by looking to see what your personality traits are, and then you know, down the road actually doing your performance reviews and in some cases, making the decision to terminate you. And now while that sounds very futuristic, there are thousands of programs out there for employers to buy. The HR technology market in the past year, employers are spending around over $20 billion in this, and it's supposed to double within the next few years. So, so as, as much as it is a futuristic conversation, when I started to dive into this, a lot of the discussion about technology in the workplace was that robots replacing humans, right? In automation, you've all read about the robots replacing factory workers, yep. uh, replacing uh, drive through fast food employees. So there was a lot of distraction related to that, and that was more, you know, of jobs are going to be displaced. But in reality, it's these tools that are being used to assess, hire, fire employees that are being used now, how are they complying with long-standing 
um, existing laws, which we're going to get into a very specific example. So that's just a little bit of a background of why I decided to, to dive into this personally and, and really try to make a difference and to make the people who are critically designing, developing these programs, which are not labor employment lawyers, they're not HR people, they're computer uh, engineers from Silicon Valley who if you say you get artificial intelligence, you get hundreds of millions of dollars. And, and that is really where this critical conversation is, where normally you're dealing with legal compliance in corporations, HR departments, in-house counsel, outside counsel of how you actually design and build your HR programs. But here, the people who are actually designing it and developing them know nothing about HR, know nothing about the significant laws like Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, the Americans with Disability Act, big ticket labor laws that actually apply to the programs um, they're making. So that's really where I've been trying to put my foot down and we can go into much more depth than that. So that's just a little bit of an overview of um, what I do during my day job and what my hobby is related to regulating artificial intelligence. Yeah, and that really, what you described, kind of ties into a lot of what we're trying to do at Duke, because the way I always describe it is it takes a village to do this properly, and you have to bring the engineers together with the lawyers so that they understand at the design phase what the legal requirements are and can build the tools and the use cases so they comply. Right. Um, I'm just curious, I mean, you've been And it's even further back than that now. So that's where a lot of conversation is that we, now we need the legal departments to work with computer scientists and ethicists getting involved and in teaching programmers and coding what you're building and the legal ramifications of that because a lot of it for coders, um, and I don't know if any of you are, are coders or have been, ha have that background, you know they don't really know what the big picture is right. of their product. You know, they're working on discrete assignments, sort of like when you're a summer associate or first year lawyer, when you're just giving a one research assignment, you don't see the broader picture of where that is going into a summary judgment motion or being used at trial. So it, it's taking a step back and getting into communities that not only labor and employment lawyers haven't been involved in in a long time, ever, but also you know all the different aspects of ethics of law, which I know you're, you're working on. But even taking a further step back from those, the, the, the ones actually designing it, it's the people who are investing in it as well. Yep. Like I said, you know, you see now everything uh, in the news with AI, 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 uh, money, 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 everyone wants to get into it. But what about even going a step further and getting back to the people who are funding these programs and saying, well, do you want to fund a program that's going to cause mass discrimination? That's going to exclude somebody from the workforce based upon their race, color, ethnicity? Of course they don't want to do right, that. Right. Do you want Un, and nor do the people who are selling the products want to have products that do that because nobody would buy the product. Right, right. Because the EEOC would be there. So it's this whole chain of people who are not necessarily familiar with the day-to-day -day work of, of what we do and, and getting them all involved. And that's for all uses of AI, much broader than just employment and healthcare and finance. And I know you're broadly looking at everything. Bring it back a little bit to the EEOC. I mean, you've been um, a real thought leader, as has Brad, and, and, and been really passionate about these issues. But um, you know, the EEOC as an agency has also been really active of trying to put um, more enforcement behind the current laws that we have. And maybe the two of you can just explain a little bit about what the EEOC is doing to try to rein in some of the, some of the harms. Yeah, well, let me just start with the, the problem here uh, and, and sort of setting the background of how discrimination claims work um, in the United States. And the EEOC under Title VII actually has more limited authority than, let's say, the Department of Labor or OSHA so prior to this, I was at the Wage and Hour Division of the Department of Labor. It says overtime, minimum wage, child labor. A wage and hour investigator, an OSHA investigator, could walk into this room right now without uh, a warrant, without a subpoena, and do an investigation. And, and you basically you know, can't stop them from doing that related to uh, health and safety. The EEOC's jurisdiction is much more limited. We are based on employee complaints, which is called the charge of discrimination. So the EEOC is really dependent on employees coming to us and filing a charge of discrimination so we can start an investigation. And once we can start an investigation, we can, 
look more broadly at the workforce to see if it's a systemic issue, to see if it's a policy or practice that's causing the discrimination, or if it was just a, a bad manager. But it takes the employee being aware that they were fired, that they didn't get the promotion, or something happened to them, you know, based, whether it's based on sexual harassment, whether it's based on retaliation, whether it's not getting accommodation because they're disabled. So that's how our cases start. And there's no shortage of cases. As you see, you know, a lot of our stuff, especially when it related to the Me Too movement, was front page, CEOs were getting fired, everything with the pay equity and the women's soccer team. You know, a lot of employees, based upon HR departments, if you've ever worked, you know, in the corporate setting, you remember those HR trainings and the videos you have to watch and, and all the documents you have to sign. So you are understanding of your rights as an employee to be able to complain and, and exercise your rights under this law. So um, that is generally how our cases of discrimination work. You cannot sue your employer in the United States without coming to the EEOC. Um, so we see every cl claim of discrimination um, possible. But so when it comes to uh, AI and enforcement relating to artificial intelligence, it's a little more difficult. And we haven't seen these big blockbuster cases both in the private sector, in class actions, or from a federal government investigatory standpoint, because why? because that requires the employee coming forward. That employer requires the employee filing a charge of discrimination, saying I wasn't hired this job because an algorithm screened me out because I am you know, a woman over 50 years old and um, we can get into how those kind of discriminations happen with computers, but how do you know a computer made that decision versus a human, right? So you don't know that your actual employment decision is being made by a computer. So we haven't really seen these kind of cases, and a lot of it with some states and um, local jurisdictions and foreign jurisdictions are trying to change, So I know you're doing a lot of research on, about that disclosure of saying, you know, when you're doing, it, when you're applying, when you're doing an assessment, it's being done by AI and the AI is, rate, is rating you or making the decision. That would certainly allow the employees to have their rights to know that they can then go forward and saying, well, I didn't get the job, I feel it was because of my disability and the computer program didn't have that accommodation. You know, I didn't get the job because the company set the metrics to exclude people from this demographic. Wherever you can at least start the case. So from an enforcement perspective, it's very hard um, to know about these cases and why you really haven't seen that large scale um, either class actions or government investigation. So what can we do in the meantime? Um, we can raise awareness of this and that's a big part of what I've been doing is notifying uh, employees and both employers who have bought in these products, um, and, and we can talk about the way they're sold and, and how they're getting into these Fortune 500 companies rapidly, to say, you know, here are uses of AI in employment, here are the long-standing civil rights laws, most of them from the 1960s, that apply equally to these technologies as they do if, if a human made that decision. So how do we do that? We have to go through and, and, and pick out high risk areas for these softwares to then be able to go make um, guidance. And look, we are the federal government. We, uh, employers listen to us because um, if you, as long as you have more than 15 employees, um, which is the majority of people who probably can afford to use these systems have, we have jurisdiction over them. So when we make noise about it, it gets people to pay attention. And so that's what we did. And we launched an initiative uh, in October of 2021, just raising awareness, saying, you know, this is going to be a key priority um, for the EEOC. And I think that speaks volumes. Look, we have limited resources. We have around 2,000 uh, employees around the country. And they, again, has to investigate almost every case in the private sector and the federal mm -hmm. government as well. So if you're a federal government employee, and you're discriminated against by your agency, it all goes to the EEOC. So with those limited resources, we have to make decisions about what we're making those announcements on and what we're using our resources for. So in this instance, you know, we launched an initiative basically telling everyone we're out there, and as part of the initiative, we're gonna be doing guidance, uh, have listening sessions. Um, we have a hearing coming up um, next week. But in May of last year, we released guidance on the Americans with Disability Act um, for workers with disabilities to be able to um, know what their rights are related to using online assessments, applying online, um, the prohibition against these tools, unlawfully collecting medical information that doesn't relate to the ability to do the job, 
And that was sort of low-hanging fruit in a way, because um, whether you're, you're aware of it or not, um, outside of retaliation, which is the number one claim of discrimination in the United States, uh, but that's a tack-on claim, so normally you're discriminated for something else and then retaliated for actually going in and complaining. Disability discrimination is the number one actual underlying claim of discrimination in the United States. So it, it, it was uh, an easy one for us to tackle and, and release some guidance on. So in the absence of employees being able to file these cases, to know that they're being subject to this technology, you know, we just can make a lot of noise, and we do so. So to your point, we, you know, we, we launched this initiative, we put out guidance in every law firm blog in the country. Yes, every law firm. And, and you're seeing it now, as we, we'll talk about later, our strategic enforcement plan, which is you know, yep. part of this, um, has done, you know, from big, massive corporate firms to smaller regional firms have said, the EEOC is looking at this. And what that does, it raises compliance both from an internal perspective from the companies that have maybe bought this, because companies buy a lot of software, and generally software is being meant to have a set and forget approach where you just put it on and let it run for business functions. And it's making those, everything from corporate boards, which have now started to take an interest in AI, and all the news about the chat GBT is helping this um, as well, but all the way down to compliance to say, well, are we using this stuff? And general counsels of these large companies sometimes don't even know, are we using this? How are we using it? And is it going to comply um, with the laws that the EUC enforces? So uh, we're using that um, post we have to be able to make a lot of noise. Yeah, and I must say, when the guidance was released, you're right, every law firm, every corporation um, <laughs> gravitated to it, as they should. And there was a lot of really helpful guidance in there on how to test your systems, monitoring the systems to try to reduce the risk of um, unlawful discrimination. Um, maybe you could just talk a little bit, you know, you, we've alluded to the fact that in large part we're applying laws from the 1960s to these algorithmic discrimination cases. And certainly when Congress enacted those laws, they weren't thinking about algorithms. And what are some of the challenges of applying these existing anti-discrimination laws to these new technologies? Yeah, well, I, I've been hogging the floor, Brad. If you want to talk, I'm happy if you well, want to add anything. Well, one thing I will add kind of out the gate is just kind of a shameless plug. So we co-authored an article that came out uh, a couple months ago in the University of Miami Law Review. It's called The Promise and the Peril, Artificial Intelligence and Employment Discrimination. And it really kind of summarizes, like, all these kind of key points. It talks about, you know, like how AI is being used for these discrimination kind of purposes. So for example, for the disability discrimination that we put out in May, we talked about an example of an algorithm that's using video technology that detects that you know during the interview that somebody has a twitch, that that could indicate that they have Parkinson's or some other neurological issue. So that if it screens that person out, then it would be a, you know, a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. So I, I recommend you know, reading that because also another thing about the articles, we go through the proposals about what's been proposed to address AI, and we talk about like you know the state and local laws um, as well, and what's going on at the international front. And we also go into detail about how it's you know included with the vendors, how the people who develop the software and uh, market it, how there's different liability issues there. And we also come up with best practices about what businesses could do to make sure that they comply with the law. So I think anybody who's interested in additional information, I definitely you know. So it's take only one around one ninety article. pages. Yeah. So. Yeah. But, it's a, but it's a <laughs> great take it to the beach. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great read, and those of you who are in my practicum class have read it, and we'll be discussing that in more detail <laughs> later today. Yeah. Um, but to answer your question, uh, and I think this is really relevant if you're interested in artificial intelligence, if you're interested into the governance of technology, and this is something I'm pretty passionate about when you said, you know, our, our laws are old from the 1960s. But I believe that they are old, but they're not outdated, and it is incumbent on me because you know we have separation of powers in the United States, and I can't make um, new laws. So these are the laws that are on the books, and these are the laws. No matter what the issue is, whether it's um, somebody you know saying I'm firing you because you're a woman, or I'm setting an algorithm code to figure out you're a woman and then fire you, you know it, it applies with the same strength. And, and there's so much distraction in Washington D.C. Now in state capitals, yes. now in Europe, um, as you heard very much with the Athens Roundtable, um, that, oh, we need new laws. We need new regulations. 
And uh, there was an op-ed actually this week in the New York Times by a congressman in California who you know, said we now need an, an AI commission in, or independent AI commission in Congress to then establish, see if we need to have a new AI agency which has been proposed. And all these different talks about how we're gonna regulate technology and how this works. That's a huge distraction, okay? And what that does, it takes the eye off the ball for employers right now who are using this technology and say, well, I'm okay buying this and implementing this because regulators haven't figured it out. And you know, there's a proposal in New York, Illinois has talked about the use in uh, facial recognition, and all these proposals in California and the EU, and you know, it's all big tech in Congress, you know, and can we get into the black box? Every kind of buzzword you've had, and, that's a, and that is going to harm both employees and employers right now who are, are, who are already subject to existing laws, employees subject to existing protections, or employers subject to these existing regulations and laws. And that's my job, is to say that right now, as we talk, these laws from the 1960s apply equally. And I think that's, it's only fair that the agencies, and other agencies are doing it, yes. the FTC, the FDA, when it comes to use in medical devices, saying here's the laws we enforce, and here's how it applies to technology. But at the core of it, all AI is doing is amplifying, replicating human decision making. Right? So we don't need necessarily to train our investigators on how to code, on how to understand AI. I don't understand coding. I don't understand um, what the AI actually looks like, but I don't need to because I understand labor and employment law. And our investigators do too. And when they show up to a business, what are they going to look for? They're going to look for discrimination. And then how did we get there is a different question. You know, was it by a computer or was it by a human? If it's by a human, oh, that's simple. I'm going to depose you. Did you discriminate against this person? What are you going to say? No. Yeah. Great. But now with algorithms we have in technology, we have a potentially uh, a new transparent way to look how discrimination occurred. Was it a data set? Was there only white men in the data set? Or was it a very diverse data set that was reflective of the local applicant pool, which is really you know, the standards in, in um, labor employment law of what we look for for hiring cases. But then did somebody go and make a discriminatory algorithm by clicking a few buttons to exclude people from actually being able to um, move forward in the process. So you have a lot of transparency when it comes to that. But you know, when you talk about the whole black box of AI, and if we can only say AI, that's a lot of the distraction you're hearing in Congress and state legislature, we need to see the code. What are you going to do with it? And increasingly we're seeing agencies, and it's not just the EEOC, it's the Department of Justice, right. it's the FTC, it's the DOD issuing more guidance on how to comply. Right. Um, <laughs> and it's interesting, my other class on data governance, we were looking at GDPR yesterday and looking at a lot of the commentaries about do we need extra laws and looking at the cost of GDPR um, compliance, and the fact that enforcement is lagging behind with compliance, which right. raises the question of, are we better off just enforcing our existing laws, or if we create these new legal structures, is that really going to be more efficient? And who's going to enforce and it? Who's going to enforce it? And how to get the expertise? And that's sort of the issue with, yep. the, uh, with the Act in EU. And if you don't know, uh, the European Union is proposing an Artificial Intelligence Act, and what they're doing is they're proposing risk-based categories, so from low risk to high risk to unacceptable risk. So obviously like social scoring would be in the unacceptable risk and lower risk um, algorithms um, would be less subject to scrutiny, to auditing testing. They put the use of employment in the highest right. risk possible category which would require then additional testing, auditing, and this, but then you know the pushback on that talking about how do you implement it well, who's going to be the enforcement agency for that? It's not like the United States. They have their individual member company, the member uh, companies, countries that need to go and actually do build a mechanism, sort of what we see related to um, GDPR. But that is not the state of affairs uh, in the United States. And there's just so much of, well, we can create these new agencies or we can create these new systems that are modern with what we've learned since these laws were created in the 1960s. Um, but then how are we actually going to implement it and enforce it while still 
doing everything else we have to do. And another challenge of the EU approach, which was in my recent piece that I wrote for the OECD and I mentioned at the Athens Roundtable, mm -hmm. is for the high-risk AI that would include employment, they established these requirements, like you need high-quality data sets. We did this in my class. How many of the engineers in the room understand what a high-quality data set is? Eduardo maybe understands, but like, how, and, and you need to do data governance, but they don't tell you how to do data governance, so you're setting up a legal system where right now um, there are legal requirements, but engineers don't understand how to implement them. The standards haven't caught up yet, so, you know, in theory, this could work efficiently if, as Commissioner Sonderling said, you had the right enforcement capacity. But right now, we're setting legal standards that um, people don't really understand. Um, but then that kind of brings us back to the US approach. So we talked about um, violations of the anti-discrimination laws. And you have disparate impact, where somebody intentionally discriminates um, versus disparate impact, where somebody, or that's disparate Free. treatment. Um, versus disparate impact where it's unintentional discrimination, which is also unlawful. So when you're dealing with algorithms and you have, um, you know, the computer programmer who doesn't understand the Civil Rights Act, um, training the uh, algorithm on, on data sets that may not be appropriate, but there's no intent there. Like, how do you, in that context, figure out whether the discrimination rises to the level of disparate treatment, the intentional discrimination versus a disparate impact, and the unintended, because the, the, the um, consequences for a violation are different. Yeah, they're different, but liability is going to be the same. And, and a key part of uh, U.S. employment law is that employers are liable for discrimination, whether they intended to discriminate or whether they did not intend to discriminate. The damages can be different. The affirmative defenses on how you, you know, reduce liability can be different, but just broadly, um, for your knowledge, um, that if an employer discriminates, they're liable. It doesn't matter how they got there, if there was discrimination. And, th and that's important because these, are, again, are dealing with the Civil Rights Act. This is the fundamental civil rights. So there's generally you know, two theories of discrimination. You just heard disparate treatment and disparate impact, um, and that you know, intentional versus unintentional. And the whole point of AI, the whole point of AI and HR and the way it's marketed is, well, there's not, we're gonna remove what from the equation? What, what are we gonna remove? Anyone? I'm trying to make this a law school class. HR has, stands for two words. What, what is the first? <laughs> Thank you. What are we gonna remove by using algorithms? <laughs> and where are the bias come from? <laughs> Can computers be biased? It's a whole different story. <laughs> um, but so, no, removing the human, and this is where the, 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 um, the coders and the engineers think. So, okay, so if we, bias has been an issue in employment, decision making from hiring, promotions, firing. That's the reason the EEOC exists. That's the reason in the last two years we've collected almost a billion dollars in damages against employers in the federal government for discriminating. And there's so many long standing. Um, studies about just um, bias and employment decision making, you know, just as basic as a male and female applying for the same job, the male's more likely to get selected. Or people who whiten their resumes by removing references um, to their race um, or, or, you know, associational uh, clubs are more likely to get selected than not. So, you know, that's there. It's been existing for a long time. And so now you come in and say, okay, we're going to remove all of this. We're going to remove that, that human from ever seeing that. So there can be no bias, but it's just not that simple. So going back to the two theories, intentional discrimination versus unintentional, a lot of the focus in AI is around that disparate impact, that data set discrimination, right? So how, with the data set discrimination, the classic example is related to uh, Amazon, right? Yeah. And I don't mean to call it names, but they, it's the one that everyone knows and has heard. So Amazon, basically had all the individuals who applied for, for a job and in the last 10 years for an engineering position. And then they basically had the machine learning go through and rate them one to five or whatever it was. And because the vast majority of engineers who applied were men, what happened if you were a woman? You were automatically downgraded because you weren't represented in that data set. So was there an intent to discriminate there? No. 
because they were just using who applied. And, but the liability there is going to be for women who didn't get the job, even though it was a neutral characteristic of who just applied to those jobs, that is going to be generally the determinative factor that we're going to look at, that there was discrimination, even though you didn't uh, intend to do so. And that's like a widely well-known story. Who knows if it's even true or legend at this point, but it's used all throughout uh, the discrimination context. And then for intentional discrimination, and Brad, if you want to handle um, this one, how it can be used to intentionally discriminate in the Facebook example. Yeah, well, and, and again, like as far as where you have an intentional drive, so you're directly trying to discriminate. So if you say, you know, we're going to code the algorithm, we're going to train the algorithm so that it purposely excludes any females from being considered, or, you know, it, it would purposely exclude somebody who, uh, you know, has a veteran status, which would trigger another anti-discrimination uh, law. Um, I mean, it, it's where it's intentional, where there's a nefarious purpose for what's being, you know, done with the uh, algorithm or the code. And I think one thing I do want to add is when we talk about like laws with the, you know, when we talk about the EU laws, or we talk about the different proposals at the state level, there's also a really important economic and pol uh, policy consideration about stifling innovation. You know, if any of these laws that we consider, you know, do we want to prevent, you know, the, for the full power of uh, you know this AI from realizing its full potential, its full benefits. You know, as Keith mentioned, you know you've got the Chat GPT now that everybody's talking about. You've got Dolly, which can create this amazing artwork just through an algorithm. And you know, do we want to have laws so that we are preventing that sort of thing from taking place? When you look at Europe, which has a heavy-handed approach versus the United States, which is much more light-handed or laissez-faire, you know, you, you, Europe doesn't have the equivalent of Google, Facebook, um, you know, major companies like that. So I, I think that there's a reason that our, our companies have done so well with a, a lot of this technology. So I think that when you hear about people talking about proposals at the government level, think about your experiences at the DMV. I mean, we're both, you know, government lawyers and I, we're both pretty strongly against, you know, government uh, regulation in most cases. I mean, just because I, I, I think that, you know, the, the government does, you know, especially with technology that changes so rapidly, that's changing, you know, at a very rapid rate, you know, can a government, uh, you know, bureaucracy keep up with that? And I think those are important considerations. But I employers think have to keep up well. with it. Yeah. You know, and, and whether or not we as a federal government can understand technology, can put out guidance related specific to technology, yeah. it doesn't matter. Because the employers still have to comply with the law, yeah. so it, it, it's it, you know it's a, it's a difficult situation in that sense where you know employers want all this additional guidance and, we, and they want to um, comply with the law, you know because having defended companies in private practice before I entered the government, you know that generally for most employers they want to do the right things, and then you know but they need the tools to be able to do so. So it's it's a big part. It's difficult for these agencies at the same time to help employers in that sense, but also help employees by being the a civil law enforcement agency that's responsible for concurrently actually investigating and going and make sure discrimination is not occurring and if it is levying pretty big um, fines and penalties so it, it's a very difficult balance when you're relying completely on the government to help you in this regard when it is really um, new concepts and new technology um, when you have to do it anyway so that's why a lot of it and a lot of the great work you're doing um, here is to really get employers to just start doing it themselves internally. Yep. And I think that's a big part, you know, I'll let you speak more on that. Um, but that is really where all this has to go right now. Right, and I think something else that you had said about, you know, the need for the multidisciplinary teams, which is something I'm really passionate about, that a lot of times the problems occur in the data sets mm -hmm. um, because companies want to do the right thing, the engineer who's doing the programming isn't thinking about the anti-discrimination laws, not because they're not well-intentioned or not because they're not smart, um, but because people haven't exposed them um, to what the laws are and what the legal requirements are and what the potential consequences are if they don't make careful decisions. Just like if somebody asked me to clean up a data set, I wouldn't have the slightest clue on how to do that. So, you know, working together, right. working with companies to try to um, follow the laws, it, you know, that, that exist today and this may come into effect because we haven't touched on it yet, but the states are, it's like whack-a-mole almost every day there's a new state proposal coming, um, coming into fruition. I think all kind of circling back to one of Brad's points, you know, the idea that some people say, well, let's just put this on hold till we figure out what to do 
really, as a practical matter, isn't going to work because, you know, t innovation is happening super quickly. And, you know, by and large, innovation has been a great feature of our company, of our country. We don't want to stifle innovation. And regardless of what policies we have, you know, countries like China um, and other jurisdictions that don't share our democratic values, we're not going to stop that innovation. So. Right. We really do need to take the moral leadership as a society and figure out like how can we develop this in a way and deploy it in a way so we capitalize on those benefits and mitigate those risks. And, and when it comes to you know civil rights in the workplace, people look to the United States. Yeah. And you know we are the gold standard for um, anti-discrimination laws. Um, and so now a lot of these countries, as they start to regulate technology as well, they want to regulate when it comes to artificial intelligence, you know, they're looking to us, again, because how do you test for discrimination for this, you know, the unintentional disparate impact theories? It's based upon our uh, guidelines from 1978, is, you know, when uh, employee assessment tests on Scantron uh, pencil and uh, paper were uh, popular. So that's really the basis for this testing when it comes to employee assessments, which are now largely uh, being digitized. So we are, you know, it comes to the global standard. And one more really key point that I really think will sort of um, click for all of you. In the United States, the EEOC has jurisdiction over three parties, basically. Employers, so the companies, unions, and then staffing agencies for the most part. That's it. That's our jurisdiction. So it doesn't matter who, if somebody walked out the street and said, you know, fire that person, the employer can't say, well, that person told me to do it, they're, I didn't discriminate, they're liable for it. So you see where I'm going here. With technology, the employer is liable for any decision that the computer makes. There's no affirmative defense that the robots did it, I didn't do it, I shouldn't be liable, I didn't discriminate. So without that vendor liability component, which there is in different areas, different industries, um, you know, it's, it's a whole different conversation because the vendors then can create very um, aggressive products. They can make, you know, essentially aggressive marketing because, look, a lot of these programs are designed to help employers with their diversity, equity, inclusion metrics, with to help them diversify their workforce. So, you know, as you know, companies are spending a lot of money on that every year. So now we have the ability to essentially automate that um, and companies want to do it quickly, and they, this, these programs have been able to get in the door. But at the end of the day, that vendor does not have any liability from the EEOC. They're liable to their own employees as employers, but not for that company. So you could buy a program off the, the rack, like you know, off the shelf, uh, whatever the expression is, and then let it go, and it can commit horrible discrimination. But at the end of the day, you can't turn to the vendor and say, they did it, that the EEOC is coming after that employer. And I think from a compliance perspective, different than other areas for general counsels, for legal departments, that really is raising their attention because they don't have that indemnification to turn around and, and you know, say to EEOC, go after them. They're the ones who design this bad product. Yeah, no, that was exactly where I was going to go. Because <laughs> Sorry we, to get ahead. Uh, no, 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 it's great because, you know, for um, those of you who are less familiar with the marketplace, that most companies that are using these AI tools in the workplace are getting them from third-party vendors, so they're not developing them in-house. And from the EEOC's perspective, it, even if the problem was the tool, the employer is the one that's liable, but there are other theories of liability, contract, um, other types of law where the vendor can be held liable. And, and you know, looking, I think the takeaway here is that if you're looking to put one of these tools in the workplace, do your due diligence, um, in advance, you want to make sure that you're getting a sound tool. So we could keep going on and on with questions, but I'm sure all of you have questions. So who, who wants to pose the first question? Yeah, let's. Dukies aren't shy. Go ahead. I have a question based on what you just said. Yeah. So I guess like one thing is, is there any movement to put any of this liability on vendors? Because I guess I really see that as like harming. Like I know you said it's the bigger companies that use this AI algorithm, but especially as they become more common, I see like smaller companies trying to use them. Yep. But those smaller companies don't have the means to like audit these algorithms. Whereas like obviously Facebook has lawyers that can go and check these like third party vendors, but I see it like really harming smaller companies if they can't audit the vendor and then they're the ones that are held liable, but the vendors telling them this is like a good data set. Yeah, that's really you know it's really difficult, and you know the, the state of law is that you that 
again, and I know I'm being repetitive here, but it's really driving this home, is that no matter what you're sold, now the FTC can maybe handle how you know, these products are being sold in the marketplace, um, but it, none of that matters. And a lot of vendors will go in and say, you know, we have, we've done the testing from 1978. We, look, here's a, you know, a glossy sheet, and it shows that we are, are compliant with the EEOC's uniform guidelines and employee selection procedure, right? But if you look at that, those are tests done in the aggregate with generic BLS data and or on another company. But when the EEOC comes in, we're only looking at your company's data set. So if you have 10 employees, like you're small, or 15 employees you want to hire, or 150,000, it doesn't matter. We only, that, that's our world. So um, there's um, the ability for smaller companies that don't have the resources to then, look, you're asking companies to buy this AI tool, right? Now, you know, for the larger companies, now you have to hire maybe outside counsel, in-house lawyers, accountants, or you know, whoever can do the mathematical analysis that lawyers can't to see if there's testing and to see if it's working before you ever let it potentially discriminate, right? So you're spending money and then you have to spend a lot more money on compliance if you want to do it the right way. And not everyone can afford that, and especially smaller companies that you know, don't have the HR or legal staff and need to be able to diversify um, their workforce. So that, that's a huge uh, issue right now, and um, are companies spending that additional money to do this right? It's a question we don't necessarily know. I mean, I'm telling everyone they should, and you know, that you should perform an audit, you should do all these things, um, before you actually let it make a decision on someone's livelihood. Um, but that's an extra step. And um, that slows down the process, and especially with the uh, labor market right now, where everyone wants to hire, everyone needs workers, uh, and, and they're desperate, and you have a software that's gonna help you, let's get it running as soon as you can. But to the second part of that, on the vendor liability part, and why is it this way? Uh, again, you know, I don't know. I wasn't around in the 1960s when they, they said the EEOC only has jurisdiction over the companies and no one else. Um, but we are starting to see change. So the EU AI Act is going to make vendors liable, either if you're a vendor yourself, just selling it on the market, or you're a big tech company that can create your own program, you're also gonna be liable then as a, an employer and a vendor as well. So there's different levels of damages and liability for that. We're seeing a proposal in California um, by their civil rights department um, for under California um, labor regulations to amend it to make vendors liable. So that's certainly where you know, some of the proposals are going to go to have that vendor liability because if the vendors are liable, how are the products gonna change? How are they gonna, you know, do they have more interest in then doing some of that work that the corporations have to do by themselves at this point, spend money? Do they have to do that now on the front end uh, before they can actually sell the products if they're gonna have um, skin in the game for a lawsuit. So, you know, that's certainly an issue to watch. But outside, you know, Congress amending Title VII, um, right now I can just continue in a way to scare, which I've, you know, I've said multiple times in, today, that employers, you're liable for this no matter what. And that's a tricky argument. Now, there's a whole separate um, legal analysis under you know, contract law with these vendors. I don't have this information, but we could talk hypothetically. So can now vendors turn around, can the employer then turn around and sue the vendor who bought this, you know, who you designed it, you know, you've seen another contractual liability and indemnification. I'm told that these contracts are completely bulletproof. They don't, have, they don't allow that. It's a not, uh, you don't have that you know, marketing of uh, the leverage to say, well, if, if it discriminates, we're, um, you're gonna be liable. I doubt that exists, but I heard it doesn't exist. But you know, we haven't seen, because we haven't seen these big class actions, uh, and when you talk about what other legal theories you could potentially bring against the vendors. But I, but I think also, like as far as, that's one unique thing about how we talk about existing law, like mattering, is if this goes up to the courts, the courts are well equipped to deal with you know, apportioning liability under contract law and all that. So I think that's an important kind of component about you know, the importance of the existing law as well, and whether our existing legal framework can respond to some of these uh, threats that we're uh, considering, some of the, you know, the risk associated with AI. But this goes back to where we started, and why haven't these theories been fleshed out yet, is because we haven't seen these lawsuits. But at some point, whether it's the government or class action lawyers bringing in this, you're gonna see these nasty indemnification side lawsuits between vendors, and not just in the HR space. I yeah. think it's gonna be I think largely it's gonna, it's, everywhere. Yeah, it's gonna be broader. Gonna be and, and we're already starting to see a little bit of case law. There's a case in Connecticut. It was a fair housing tool about something that was used by a landlord to screen applicants. 
and the case um, passed summary judgment um, and the court said that the vendor could be held liable potentially for the discrimination caused by the uh, customer's use of its tool based on how the um, vendor designed its tool, based on how they marketed it, because they said this is you know one-stop shop, use our tool, um, we'll help you figure out what you know who, who to grant, um, who to give housing to. So my advice to vendors out there would be just because you may not be subject to an EEOC action, and even if you can get airtight language in your contracts, you don't necessarily have a free pass here because the courts are starting to look at product liability theory. Europe is gonna be extending its, its tentacles. Um, so I think it, it really is- uh, The FTC, the, the um, FTC. what they said. But yeah. you know, we're going to see, you know, when class action lawyers, you know, there's a lot for them to do in the yep. labor and employment space. Overtime cases, sexual harassment, Me Too cases, uh, pay equity cases um, are still really their bread and butter right now. But when at some point, when these cases come up because of employee awareness, whether it's because of disclosure requirements or just these vendors putting on their websites all the big Fortune 100 companies who are using these and they figure it out, I do think when they, and if you've studied class actions or been around them, everyone's going to get sued. Yeah. And you're going to see. Um, the willingness of some of these private lawyers where the government just can't, the private lawyers will then see every vendor involved that the, that the large company hired to see what sticks and to see what those theories. So I do think those theories will be, to Brad's point, they exist under longstanding contract law or other liability law, but I do think it'll be the start, we'll start to see that in the court system. We just haven't seen anything close to that in AI. And the closest AI private litigation we saw was the ACLU versus Facebook. It was not a case the EEOC was involved in, so I can talk about it. Is that they said that a Facebook's advertising practices violated the Civil Rights Act because of the age discrimination, because they were limiting Facebook targeting to um, certain age groups and certain demographics, and um, allowing employers to go in and click like you actually doing a marketing for a product where you can say, "I want to only, you know, market to 20 to 25 year old men." who live in this area, they were doing that with employment ads, case settled so quickly, yep. right? And Facebook had a big press conference with Sheryl Sandberg there and the whole thing, how we're limiting employment advertisements to different system as well. But you know, there with a few clicks, they potentially you know, discriminated against millions of people who didn't fit that exact demographic where the civil rights laws required everyone to have an equal opportunity to be able to apply for the job. So um, that's the closest we've gotten, but it was more of a, publicity, right. lawsuit, and settled really quickly. A question? I Michelle? have a question about that um, Facebook case that you mentioned. Um, so I, I wonder, I know that the solution, the new solution there was that um, like advertisers and job seekers were, were not, no longer allowed to discriminate on the basis of gender, age, or zip code, and that it no longer targets specific demographics. But could this potentially be in conflict with diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives where an argument can be made for like target compliance, but yeah. probably an underrepresented community. Um, so like, I guess the question that I pose is like, is it perhaps potentially antithetical to the employer's you know, intent of attempting to like diversify the talent? Yeah, there's two parts to this answer. One depends if you're a federal contractor where you have diversity requirements in recruiting and then you have to have affirmative action plans, but, but we'll put that aside because most employers are not federal contractors and don't have to deal with that. There's nothing wrong with companies wanting a diverse workforce, a diverse applicant pool. And companies and the EEOC and, um, encourages um, employers to advertise all over the place and to seek the most diverse pool possible. Now, are you allowed to make a final employment decision based upon where you sought to expand your applicant pool? No, it has to be on their skills or capabilities um, or, or anything unrelated to a protected characteristic. The issue with this case is that they completely were only showing individuals who met the certain demographic, the ad, and nobody else. So the people who were excluded couldn't exercise their rights under civil rights law because they were never even um, had the opportunity to see it based upon their protected characteristics. Opposed, the right way to do it is that say, you know, my workforce is lacking somebody from this particular um, race, national origin, and we want to diversify our workforce. So we're now going to. Um, spend money and advertise with uh, local uh, groups, you know, go to different colleges than we went to. But you're not 
at the same time stopping your broad ads. You're not, you know, limiting it to that. So when it's completely limited to, the, you know, to one um, protected characteristics, which it was in that case, you know, that's where it violates the law versus, you know, it's good practice to be going in as many diverse places as possible. Okay, so here's the next one. Yeah, uh, kind of going off the idea of Facebook, which is a company where the consequences of what they're doing in the potential to discriminate are pretty high. What should the role of government be in the obligations of a company that's doing things that could easily turn into discrimination? What, what should the role of government be in making sure that company toes the appropriate lines and sets policy so it doesn't become a bigger issue? Um, I remember when I, I lived in D.C. before coming here, and I always get this ad from Facebook about how uh, Section 230 yeah. had not been changed. <laughs> they still have those ads. <laughs> where I almost have that ad. Now yes. Ad. Now I joke. And at the same point, Facebook has tur almost turned this into a problem. What do you do with those types of actors that are just creating problems almost unintentionally? And this is really uh, an interesting uh, question and, and much broader than you know the EEOC. It's just like there's laws on the books and companies have to comply with them. And you can be helpful and raise awareness like I'm doing, or I don't have to be doing anything. And the federal investigators will show up and they'll be liable for not just discrimination, for violating any kinds of laws that are on the books. So you know, how much, and it's, it sort of goes into do we uh, applaud those who are really doing the right thing and building compliance teams and hiring outside ethics, hiring outside lawyers to really raise compliance? That is a good thing, and we should encourage that. Um, but at the same point, it's like you have to do that, right? You, have to, you can't violate the law. But if you look at the EEOC's mission, the EEOC's mission is to prevent and remedy employment discrimination, promote an equal opportunity for all in the workplace. So you know, the prevent is there where we need to be doing what I'm doing now and talking about these issues and putting out compliance assistance. And the remedy is there as well. That's the, the part that nobody likes when the federal investigators come or our lawyers come because we have our independent litigating authority. Um, but that really, the um, remedy part should be used for those who do not want to comply, who do not want to take all the advice we're giving, who do not want to work with us. You know, if, if one company goes and reads a guidance on anything, right, AIDS discrimination, retaliation, and they, you know, rely their HR practices on what the EEOC says, which you probably should because we're the ones that enforce the law, and then, you know, they copy one of our procedures and they say, we read it, we've trained everyone on this, versus somebody else who said, I didn't do anything for our investigator with limited resources. Where are we going to spend the most time on? The company is using it as a competitive advantage. A company that doesn't didn't care to do compliance initially, didn't, didn't look at all the material we gave them to prevent this situation, versus the company that really tried and they may have made a mistake, right? Um, you know, it just a resource thing, and that's where it comes to down to our resources. So that's why I'm really encouraged, not only in AI, but all, you know, everything, um, self-compliance, self-regulations, and, and the companies who do that are just going to be in a better position when the government or class action lawyers or plaintiffs lawyers come knocking. Go ahead. Um, excuse me. Uh, so you talked about the uh, EOC being limited to acting based on employee complaints mm -hmm. and the potential issues that has with algorithms because it can, you know, if you believe the black box idea, it can mask the decision making. Yep. Um, so, but then at the same time, it's maybe not that unlike a, a standard discrimination charge where you know, you're a member of a protected class, you suspect you have an adverse decision, and you yep. suspect that that's the reason, um, and then the rest is just borne out yep. through you know, the investigation. Um, so, but the issue still, I think, is maybe with the employee uh, knowing to make a complaint. Um, how have you seen complaints come through uh, about uh, AI decision making and hiring decisions, or how do you anticipate them coming through going forward? Well, I have to talk hypothetically because I can't talk about any active investigations. Okay. But there is another tool we have. So um, I said how our jurisdiction is limited to employee complaints, but Congress gave the um, commissioners the ability to file what's called a commissioner charge. So um, I can go in and, and sign an affidavit that I think that the company is discriminating 
and it will start an investigation. As you can imagine, it would probably start a very big investigation if the uh, commissioner is doing it because Congress only gave commissioners that specific power. Um, and a lot of commissioner's charges in the past have turned out to be massive, massive systemic cases where um, the issue has been an actual policy or procedure of the company to um, discriminate, whether a lot, sometimes intentionally, sometimes um, not, but those cases get um, a lot of publicity in itself, and it's happened from commissioners reading um, the newspaper or watching 60 Minutes and then starting a big federal investigation into that. So there are some um, tools, but what that does is it requires somebody either from one of these vendors um, who have, you know, whether they're in-house counsel to vendors or in-house counsel at these companies, in a way to be a whistleblower to be able to come to me because they have a duty to their company uh, or outside, you know, the accountants or lawyers who are seeing this. Um, and they're not really whistleblowers because it's, they're, you know, they could be representing victims of discrimination. So we really haven't um, seen that. Um, that would be probably um, the easiest way to actually start a, an enforcement action that has teeth if, you know, an ex-employee of a vendor comes forward saying, I know this company, I used to work there, they're using this algorithm and it's completely um, eliminating women from the workforce. It's, it's never that simple for a whole host of reasons. But yeah, to your point, um, it takes investigating the charges. And it takes um, knowing that, okay, that person wasn't promoted and they feel it was a discriminatory purpose. And it takes us doing an investigation to get in there to say, well, okay, wow, it wasn't a human who made that decision. It was this program they bought that actually, or made, that made that decision making. So that will come out through the investigative process, uh, but we do get um, around you know, 60 to 70,000 charges of discrimination and picking the ones we actually um, investigate um, versus time lapsing for the employee to be able to go to the, uh, a plaintiff's lawyer and then sue their employer. You know, the employee only needs to wait 180 days before they can go hire their own lawyer and tell the EEOC they're not interested in, in waiting for the EEOC. We, you know, we are a government agency. It does take a long time. There's investigation that goes on for uh, years in the federal sector. Sometimes there's investigations that go on for 20 or 30 years. Um, so you know, it is just uh, an efficiency standpoint and what, um, what actually gets assigned to investigator and what goes through the document request process. So it's really hard to, um, answer uh, in the aggregate. But to your point, yeah, if we get a normal charge, it looks like a normal charge, and then we uncover an AI system, that would certainly turn into what's called a systemic investigation, where it's no longer about that one individual employee, it's about the entire workforce, which is why charges of discrimination are very dangerous for companies, because one employee can come and say, I felt like I was discriminated against. And a lot of time, vast majority of time, it's one manager who's, um, who's racist or discriminatory, whatever it is, and it's just that individual. But if we see something, it can explode to every worker in that company. And for companies that have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of workers, these cases get very big. But this would be very much um, a, a case that could switch to a systemic investigation, which to your point would then get to the much broader issue. And what's interesting about that is if, if you haven't read um, their article, I highly recommend it, but one of the tools that you called out in the article is increasingly using the commissioner charges to try to address some of these issues. And it did not slip by me that that also is now a big feature of the draft strategic enforcement plan of the EEOC. So if I were advising a company, I would say it would be reasonable to expect to see more of these um, commissioner charges. Well, Math by law, I'm not allowed to talk about I know you can't, yeah. but I can say, you know, me as a Duke professor. You can talk about client, commissioner say, charges can, can, yeah, and whether or not they may be happening. Connecting the dots. It was not a question. It was an observation. Well, we could go on all day, but it is 1.30. Um, so, Commissioner, Mr. Kelly, thank you so much um, for joining us. We all learned uh, a tremendous amount, and we are very grateful for you taking time out of your super busy schedule to, to join us today. So, please join me in thanking you.